I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you coming, or spending some time with us. And I'm really pleased today to introduce to you Michael Webb. Uh, what a wonderful story, and it's very similar to mine in so many respects. So, uh, Michael, thanks for coming, and thanks all the way life. from Washington. I yeah, I've been looking to... forward to this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. It's, tell us a little bit about your background. Where were you born? And Born and raised in Salt Lake City. Pioneer heritage on both sides of my family. My great great grandfather was part of the Mormon battalion. Oh my! Uh, so my grand my great grandfather walked across the plains at age nine without a, without a father or mother because he was in the battalion. Oh my! And very very it's been that's that's where it all started with us was was somewhere back in the mid 1800s. Yeah, your parents yeah. were active then. In very the active parents. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So you were born in the covenant and baptized at eight and all that. Baptized at eight, born in the covenant, had all the callings, growing up as a deacon, teacher, priest. Yeah. You know, very dedicated, loved it, had a great experience, grew up in the East Mill Creek area of Salt Lake City and very pioneer area. That's where yeah. they, uh, they, our chapel was built like by the pioneers in the late 1800s. That's where President Hinckley was from. And he was from that stake. He was yeah. stake president and yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, a lot of heritage there. I had a great childhood. I, I had a great experience in the church growing up. Yeah, yeah, I did too. Returned missionary, the whole works, went to Mississippi. Where'd you go on Mississippi? Mississippi Jackson. Yeah. Learned a little bit of Southern. Yeah. Yeah. That was a great experience. Uh, I, I was one of those 18 monthers. I was yeah. called for two years. They changed 18 months, and I got home six months early. And my mom was thrilled. Uh, yeah, that's a, <laughs> they changed that during the Vietnam War era. There. Oh, I never knew. I didn't know that. I don't know if that was part of it or not, but so, a compromise with the army or something. But it's ironic because I was out teaching the people in the Bible Belt, and now, now I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> who who would have known? Who would have known? God so tell it, after after your mission, uh, you end up down in Cedar City or is no, no, I, was I, I was in the Salt Lake City area for most oh, of my life. Okay. I did live in Louisiana. I went back to my mission field for a year and tried living there, oh, okay. but just it was hard to get employment and stuff yeah. like that. So we came back. Okay. So I've been in Salt Lake all all my life except for the the five years before we went to Washington. We lived up in Heber City and Midway, and Midway okay. Utah, which was a beautiful place. All right. Yeah. So and you. Uh, you come home from your mission, come and you end up working in the temple. I understand. Well, I right? worked in the well. I before my yeah. I went to Dixie College for a while and was a veil worker there. Maybe that's yeah. what I, I misunderstood. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. was before your mission then that you were down there and. Bef no, right you? after my mission. Oh, right I went after. down to Dixie College and I worked in the Sorry. temple. Yeah. Okay. The temple there. How was that? Well, Earl, I the first time I went, you know, I, I never, I don't, I'm, I, don't, I, didn't, I, I felt uncomfortable. But in the temple? In the temple. I didn't like it. I didn't understand it, and nobody seemed to want to talk to me about it. And you can't talk about it outside. You can't talk about so, it outside, yeah. and that was before they made some changes, and it was just really odd to me. Yeah. And But as a Mormon, you want to get, the more you go, you'll get it, you'll get it. So I became a veil worker, and I tried, I really tried hard. Yeah. But it never clicked in me. <laughs> it just seemed, it just seemed Jesusless. Jesusless, yeah. So, so what? Uh, so you uh, get married and you get married, and, have a yeah. have a couple of kids, yeah. beautiful daughters who are both return missionaries. 
uh, but uh, went through a divorce and then married my sweet Angie, who I've been married for 25 years now. We'll get to meet her next week. And we get to marry, yeah. yeah, we have five kids, yeah. and uh, it's been an amazing journey. You know, you never know what the twists and turns are going to bring, but God has it all yeah. planned, and you just, boy, when you're in His hands and you're putting your trust in Him, it's an adventure. Now you and Angie get married in the Salt Lake Temple. The Salt Lake Temple. We have a Toyota jump in front of the, you know, Salt oh, yeah. Lake Temple there. Yeah. <laughs> With her feet in the air, and you know, had a great, great picture. And so we'll learn more about her story. But she's active, and of course, and you're you're active as a couple. Yeah, very, we were very active. I yeah. mean, you know, I was in the Elders Corn presidency. She was young women's president. Um, our kids were raised in the church, and that's the way it was going to be until early 2000s. Things began to really trouble me. Well, before that, you you actually was involved with with Embryo Records. Yeah, so. yeah that's right. I uh, I was a songwriter, aspiring songwriter, and I entered a contest that Lex Desavedo, that did all the music for Saturday's Warrior, mm. had put on, and I won the contest in one of the categories. And then he called me in Louisiana, where I was living, oh. and said, "I'd like to. I'm moving to from Hollywood to Utah. I'm going to start a Mormon label. I want you to be my first artist." Wow. So I was like, okay. I was like, this guy was a hero of mine. Yeah. So he signed me up, and then Kenneth Cope was signed up shortly after that. That's where I met Kenneth, who's a dear friend of mine. And we were, him and his daughter, Julie, and Kenneth and I were three of his first, her, his first three artists. Wow. And I put probably 10 or maybe even 12 CDs out over the years in the LDS market. That's like a Lighthouse was a song most people would, were familiar would with. Know. Yeah. And these were used like at EFYs? And, and that, well, then I began to write for EFY and actually co-produce. Now, that's, we should explain that's especially oh, for youth, I guess. Yeah, that BYU was, youth camps, yeah. especially for youth. Yeah. So that in, in 87, they decided, hey, let's put an album together every year for the kids to take home. Oh, and sure. so Kenneth and I and Julie and others wrote music for that first called Sailing Home. That's where Like a Lighthouse came from, that whole theme of yeah. the ocean and sailing. Okay. And uh, and then later on, I co-produced one of the albums with Kenneth for EFY, called Return with Honor, and wrote many, many songs and submitted each year for that program, yeah. Just never any question in your mind or heart oh, that I, the church was... Earl, was I true. never dreamed I would ever leave it. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. But in 2004, I was writing, I wrote, uh, again, was writing for EFY. This is probably where it really started to trouble me inside. I wrote a song called I Was Made to Praise Him. And pra Jesus. Praise you Jesus, mean? right. <laughs> I was made to praise him, which was not a typical Mormon idea. Yeah. But I had been listening to some pastors and other other sermons which just were feeding me and feeding me. And I submitted this and the producer loved it. But when he submitted it to the committee, the guy on the committee said, I was made to praise him. That just doesn't resonate with me. <laughs> and when I heard that I, I knew right then I was on a different planet than, than most of my associates and, and family and friends. And I, I, I went to my face in prayer for two years. I, just, I wanted the truth of grace. I wanted the truth about the cross, the nature of God. I just wanted the truth. And after two years, I sit down with the Bible, took off my glasses, you know, my, my presuppositions. So this is about 10 years ago? Yeah, 10 years ago. Okay. I'm reading the Bible again. I read it. I was a missionary. I'd read it in my life. I finished that reading in 2006. And I realized that I'd been in church every week for 42 years and never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, and that seems like a harsh thing to say, but it's the truth. It's like scales came off of my eyes and all these scriptures, he who knew no sin became sin. Christ died while we were still sinners. You know, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. All these things that I'd never seen before. If you want to go by the law, you'll be cursed. He became a curse for us. You can't be saved by grace or you'll, you'll end up boasting. It's all of faith. You know, all these things that somehow didn't come up at me in my whole 42 years as a Mormon. They were just I know leaping exactly at the page. What, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, and I, I, I had two choices. I, I don't want to cause a mess, so I'll just go along or I now am learning something about the real Jesus, and I'm going to be loyal to him no matter what the cost. And it wasn't easy, but that was my only option. Yeah. Yeah. And you said that uh, that you just, I mean, you just were so full of the I began to spirit. devour. I could not get enough of the, of the Bible. I mean, I couldn't get enough. My, my, I would be on the porch for hours just reading, reading the Word, reading, listening to sermons, A.W. Tozer sermons, who died in the 60s, uh, John Piper sermons, uh, Paul Washer, who's an itinerant missionary, these, all these men who I believe God brought into my path to teach me the whole counsel of God, 
to teach me what it's like to be, I, I'm, I'm discovering suddenly what it's like to be transformed by the Holy Spirit instead of conforming to some pattern of behavior. It's a total night and day difference. It's a difference between religion and Between and religion relation. and relationship, yeah. yeah. And, and my wife is going, okay, now. Yeah, I was going to ask, <laughs> what is she thinking about this? Well, she's an amazing person, and she knew that I was not just trying to be difficult. She could tell it was a real a, a, a quest for truth for me. Yeah. She made it very clear she would never leave. She had no interest in leaving. But at that 2006 experience, I had no choice. And so my church became sitting on the porch listening to sermons until I found a place to, to call you know, my home church. And that took a while. But uh, What is it that Mormons are missing? I know exactly what you're saying. And it's a little twist of the thought process that, that puts Jesus in front instead of putting us up. You even yeah. mentioned it as kind of a navel uh, it, it just it's, it's this navel gazing like am I navel good enough gazing, am I, am I, am I doing it enough am I it, once I set my we're eyes always on, looking in the yes, word and like, what are we what doing what do I need to do what do, what do, do I to? have to do yeah. and when I finally by the grace of God set my eyes on Christ and stop trying really really hard that's the irony yeah you can try all your life you might be good at it for a week or six months and, and conquer this or conquer that but until you just drop all of that quit trying so hard and give it focus to, on christ just like turn true. your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow dim yeah. in the light of his glory and grace that's what happened to me suddenly all these sins i had battled with and wrestled with and addictions i'm not ashamed to admit it i want people to see the man i was and the man i am i'm not the man i used to be yeah because suddenly my heart changes and I don't desire things I desired before. It wasn't like, I gotta try, I gotta really try. I don't want him, I want him. He is way more beautiful than that. He is way more compelling than that. And just, just that's how the, the journey began. And my wife watching this, unbeknownst to me going, there's something happening here, you know, that she couldn't discount. She's you know? be you're becoming a new creature. A new creature, yeah. exactly. And so it, it's, it's been an amazing thing. So what? So instead of Jesus just being my assistant, okay, this yeah, is my assistant, your Jesus, little helper, my yeah. little helper. Yeah, he's everything. He's living his life in me. Now I obey. I don't want to sound at all smug, but I know. it's a different. It's a different approach. Yeah. I, it's no longer. I love this quote. It's no longer. Uh, I I obey, therefore I'm accepted. It's I'm accepted, therefore I obey. Exactly. That's the difference. It's not a license to sin. It's or, not, no, why uh, would you? Or we even want to. When you belong to him, you want to live for him, and he makes you able to live for him and willing to live for him. And now instead of his assistant, he actually, you have this love, loving relationship with him where he's manifesting his very life through you. Yeah. And that's called freedom, Earl. Yeah, that <laughs> that's is freedom. freedom. That is freedom. You know, and it's just been an amazing change. So Angie was noticing these changes. Your family, I guess, was well, noticing them. Well, here's the funny them. part. We yeah. moved to Heber City, yeah. actually Midway, Midway. Yeah. And, and I, again, I wasn't going to go to church. I was, I was supportive of where she was, too. I, she was still going to church with very the kids? Very much so. Okay. And she, had, she had just been a young women's president. Hoping that you were going to come back. Hoping. Oh, big time Pray. hoping. She'll tell you some more of that. There's some great <laughs> stories there. And so uh, we're up in Midway, and I'm not going to church, and, I, and I'm trying to find a church now that we moved. And bless her heart, she finds a flyer for High Point Church in Heber City. Maybe I ought to try this one. So she I gives go, that to you? She gives it to Good me. Good for her. That becomes the very church where all my family find the Lord. Okay. Wow. So, I mean, that's really emotional for me because we're yeah. gonna, I'm going to be leading worship there tomorrow just as I'm visiting and I'm going to go back to this little teeny church of maybe 50 people and I'm going to lead part of the worship again just, just to visit with them and stuff. But that's the very church where I'll baptize in Derek Christ. I had already been baptized. But, no, I was baptized by him when I moved there and then years later, in my the, family, Eli, my uh, other boy, and my daughter, Emma, were all baptized by this pastor. And she's the one who said, I'm never leaving Mormonism, but here's a church here's you might want to check out. <laughs> You know, God works in mysterious ways. Uh -huh. And so, and it took a while. It was when I got out of the way. Like, I kept getting in the way. Angie, don't you know that, thing is, I didn't leave the church because of history. I didn't know any of that stuff. I read the Bible and realized I'd never heard the gospel, and I had no choice. The gospel of grace and, and yeah. what? Yeah, but then I began to discover the history. And I'm like, Angie, look at this. Angie, this is, this is Masonic stuff. Angie, this is, he had 40 wives. And, and the walls would go up. And so, I, she can tell her story, but yeah. But miracles happen after that. So you know what? My story is exactly opposite of that. Yeah. I learned the bad news, the history, the problems, oh, okay. the verse vision, yeah. Abraham, Book of Abraham problems, Book of Mormon problems. I came out not knowing this Jesus. Okay. And all of a sudden I'm saying, okay, well, Christianity, what have you got for me? And all of a sudden 
and you've referenced a book called uh, Phil Philip Yancey's yeah, book. Yeah, What's So uh, Amazing About Grace. What's So Amazing About Grace. Yeah. And all of a sudden, my eyes start seeing a different Jesus. Yeah. And that there's a different, there's a possibility here that I've missed something. It is such a different Jesus. Oh, my goodness. It's such a different Jesus. So did she started going to church then? So she, to support me. Yeah. She started coming to church, and she'll probably tell that story. Yeah. And then God began to work in her heart. I got out of the way, and I repented and said, Lord, this is your work, not mine. And and you've been involved in some of the worship teams? So then I started so? leading worship uh, at this little church in Heber City. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and they couldn't really pay much, you know, because sure. there were 40 people, 50 people. I found an ad. I was working two hotel jobs, 16-hour days, Deer Valley and Holiday Inn Express, mm -hmm. killing me, you know. <laughs> and, I, and I saw an ad for a worship leader position. Uh, director of Worship Arts in Oak Harbor, Washington, on Woodby Island. And I, all I had as a resume was my testimony of coming out of Mormonism. I sent them some of my music to hear my voice, yeah. my testimony. I get a phone call, Michael, your testimony, you know. Yeah. And the second I got that call, and I was a, one of many candidates, God told me, not in my head, yeah. but I knew we were going. I knew he was bringing us to Oak Harbor, and we've been there for two years, and I Has direct all wonderful? the music and all the arts there, huh? Has it been wonderful? It's been an amazing, and, and I felt strongly that all of my family was going there for their own purposes. Yeah. My son, Eli, who you'll meet, who the people will meet, thriving, <clears throat> um, just thriving. Ethan, who's the, the youth mission, the youth worship leader for the youth, uh, my 17-year-old. Emma, who's coming into Orleans, just, we've all had an amazing experience there. We're supposed to be there, and it's just great to, to know that God's at the helm, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, there's so many questions. Uh, what should LDS people do? I mean, we know so many good LDS people. You probably well, still have family in, all, in the mean, church. I don't know any that aren't, aren't good. <laughs> what is it? I, well, that's true. And they're, they're striving They're, they're to, trying so hard to be good when the goodness is God in them. And if they could just be free and relax, not relax. They're so afraid that means they're going to just fall off... Yeah, and all of a sudden become yeah. this. But these what great happens is the irony and... is when you, you only become like Christ as He's living in you, and you stop trying to do it yourself. That's the only. It's the iron. The, grace is the only thing that works. So what <laughs> should what should the Mormons do? What should they, if they're even listening to this and thinking, well, of course they're, they're thinking we're both nuts, but uh, <laughs> yes, if they, they don't think that and they say, you know what, I've wondered about the masonry in the temple and i've been uncomfortable there and i've wondered about this and that so what should they do you started reading the bible i the bible is the is the very reason i would give if i had to, had to give one word answer it's the only anti-mormon book i've ever read but yeah. anyway um <laughs> and read it as a child as, read it as, as a child as the wilders would say and yeah if, if you just put your fears aside there's just so much fear i think there the trust God that he won't lead you astray. Take all your presuppositions off. Read, especially the New Testament, and just just prayerfully, intently read it, and then God will do the rest. Did you sacrifice a lot with friends and, and Lex and Kenneth Cope and all no, these others? Kenneth others? is the dearest soul, one of my dearest friends, and always will be. It definitely changes some dynamics yeah. of the relationships. In my family, my brother was bishop for five years in the ward we grew up in. Oh, just got released. Okay. Yeah. Um, I love my brother, but we, we are on extremes, obviously. And so there's no shunning, but there's definitely people that weren't as interested in being with us. And there's definitely some dynamic changes for sure. Yeah. So that was difficult. Again, showing patience and love right. is, is the best thing to do. A amen. The gentleness and meekness. And yeah. that... That's I've gotten better at. Let's just say that. I've gotten yeah. better at that. <laughs> Still well, have work to do. I know we've touched on it a little bit, but what did Jesus mean to you as a, as a Mormon and now as a Christian? Well, he, the thing is, Earl, he meant a lot to me. Like when I would write my LDS music, it was very Christ-centered. Oh. I feel like he was wooing me from the very beginning. So you can see where God was kind of softening your heart even... I believe Jesus was the very reason I left because I wasn't getting him. Yeah. You know, it's like an inoculation. You know, you get a flu shot, they give you just a little bit of flu so you never get the flu. And I feel like Mormonism is dangerous because you get just enough Jesus to where you never really get Jesus. Oh. And so, what I, that an sounds, interesting it sounds harsh, but that's just, that, that would be the difference. I would say, yeah, he's not everything. He's one of many things in the church. Yeah. He's got to be everything. You seek him and him first, everything else will come with that. You know, and so, but I loved him my whole life and, and tried to serve him and would get so mad when people say, you, you believe in a different Jesus. And I would go, what are you talking about? I completely see that now. But God has to, you, yeah. you don't know what you don't know Yeah. until God shows you. Yeah, that's And then right. it's as clear as a bell and you're going, how did I not see that for 42 years? Yeah. And I don't, 
I feel very blessed and humbled by that, not like, now I know something you don't know. It, it's just been an amazing thing. Yeah, I think that's kind of what I struggle with uh, in trying to share my story, too, and, and, uh, and our witness as we are on and interacting with people is just how to bridge that little bit of a gap where yeah. you don't... You wrote, it, he's not just all we need, he's all we have. All we have. Yeah. And, and, and when you accept that, then the Bible means so much more because it's telling his story of grace and, yeah. and, and then the cross starts meaning something that it never meant before. The cross, didn't, I mean, <laughs> the cross is everything. Everything was not only paid for there, we're sitting here today because of that. The wrath is removed because of that. Yeah. All we have without that is utter condemnation. Yeah. Every good thing, every bad thing worked for our good was purchased on that tree. And here you are, a veil worker in the temple, yeah. <laughs> knowing now what the temple really was all about, the shedding of animals' blood sprinkled on the altar, right. I, and how that relates to there, now what Jesus did on the cross. I know. How do you take a garden scenario and say that's the atonement? Where was the slaughter? Where was the, the shedding shed? Of the blood. shed. There was sweat blood, but where's the shed blood? Yeah. You know. No. I. But I never. That's an al and that, that's something I didn't see till after. But I can't understand why dear friends and family can't see, there's nothing about the temple now that has anything to do with the temple then. It oh. doesn't even, it's oil and water. Yeah, you know? totally different. Totally different. Well, you were mentioning just before we started here about how, how is it that nobody else sees this? Am I the only one I seeing know. this? I know. <laughs> it's so frustrating, and that's where you have to trust God. He's a, he's a big man. Because it took this. us a while, too, It took right? us a while, and you, ha you have to do that, too. Wait yeah. a minute, I was there. Be patient, be loving. Yeah. But the frustration is you want them to be free. You want them to be free in Christ and have that relationship and just let go of all that and let him change you from the inside out instead of all these things you have to do. Yeah. You know, thinking, you know, thinking that they're earning their way. Thinking that they're earning their yeah. way. and Because and, and, we're always going to fall short. I mean, if I say to a, uh, an LDS person, if I die right now, I know right where I'm going. They would, as Bill McKeever sometimes says, think I'm arrogant. But... They don't understand it's not because of my works, because in their mind they're going, that means you've done all this and this and this and this yeah, and this. Look how no, perfect I am. It know. means because Jesus has done all of that. Yeah. He's all we have. None of that stuff is going to do anything for you, <laughs> you know? Oh, my goodness. Uh, you mentioned, too, about the eighth article of faith in the Bible, about how that... Uh... Well, I just feel like that is a huge tool that the adversary uses <laughs> because it puts a cloud over the very thing that is going to enlighten the mind to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the... <laughs> and, then, and there that eighth article of faith says, as far as it's translated. As far as... Yeah, they, so we've just dismissed the Bible. We just dismiss it. Yeah, okay, Angie got, a great, Angie got a great story about that too. But, you know, the thing that's so dangerous about that is that you, you're, you, you stay blinded. And then Satan has this great plan of coming up with another book that people can be on fire about. Yeah. That they think is very similar, but in reality... It's just a distraction from the actual Word of God. Like the garden is a distraction from where the actual payment for our sins took place. Yeah. There's all these distractions. Just keep them away from the real thing. You know. That's Satan's yeah. best method. Yeah, there's beautiful, and... There are beautiful things in the Book of Mormon, yeah. But there's also things that are keeping people in bondage. Who is going to deny themselves of all ungodliness on this planet? Nobody can do that. But until you do that, His grace won't be sufficient. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's just... I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's just no. It's it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, gosh. Um, any. I know we've got just a couple of minutes left. Uh, you're are you still writing music? I'm are still writing, writing music. Christian music? Uh, well, I've got like 50 songs on a shelf. Do you? I, I have nowhere to go, to go with because it costs money <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to to produce them. Um, they are, they are playing one on the Sounds of the Sabbath called Growing Older, all about, you know, am I growing wiser, kinder, more like Christ, or am I just growing older? Yeah. So that's, that's on there. But otherwise, I don't have a whole lot of outlet for that except at church, and I don't use my own songs at church. It's not about that. It's about praising God. Sure. That's another thing that's been awesome is just everything at church. You, you don't have to go, where's Jesus and all this? It's all about, about Him. About Jesus. All the music, all the preaching. And you can say, well, there's more to life but what they don't understand until you get that everything else doesn't fall into place it's just a, it's been a wonderful experience it's just powerful well, now i know you'd experienced christian music before you, you became christian but i you, think that's where the seeds got planted yeah, for years not knowing that christian. i was hearing the actual biblical truth through music and i think that's what began to trouble me on the inside yeah where's I jesus mean, in our 
Mormon worship and, and yeah. But when you first went to a church, did that? Uh, you know, I was a mortgage broker and a really good associate in that field. Was a Christian and invited me up to Mount Life up in Park City a couple times. Yeah, loving music like I did, I was weeping as we were praising God. And that's also was part of my journey. This, this Christian who invited me to church. Never done that before. I never got in my face. but And I would try to tell him how the Book of Mormon is just like the Bible. And it's very Christ honoring. And he would just listen and smile. <laughs> but all the time praying for me. I had so many people praying for me. Earl, I had a dear friend in Louisiana who prayed me into the kingdom. He's since passed away from a heart failure. Prayed me into the kingdom. And I just praised God for those people that God put in my life to, to continue to pray for me, intercede for me. So... If I had any final words, I mean, yeah. if you were to say, what would you say to... To the LDS or to uh, your yeah, family yeah, friends? I would say Jesus is enough. You know, we can't add to his sufficiency. We must not add to his sufficiency. You know, when you start adding to that, that becomes subtraction. You know what I mean? Yeah, anything we try to add to that is, is just Yeah, so we have two choices. We either hope on our own righteousness, which I believe the Mormon church is all about, and which is woefully going to make you fall short, yeah. no matter who you are, totally Thomas perfect. Monson or whoever, you're not going to get there. Or we flee to another's perfect righteousness, a, an alien righteousness, not our own. It's Jesus Christ is the only righteousness that's going to get us there. He died for us while we were still sinners, while we were enemies to God. And so, you know, what makes him such an amazing Savior isn't that he saved us because of us, but in spite of us. Yeah. And that should give the believer a motivation to pursue holiness, to be Christ-like, but if we get it backwards, we have no gospel at yeah. all. I'm learning, do I have to, to one more minute? Yeah, yeah. I'm learning the Heidelberg Catechism. And the first question of the Catechism is, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And as a Mormon, I would answer that, well, I'm going to be with my family forever. And we have living prophets. And yeah. those are, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to, yeah. but the answer is, and the, and, the, and the answer part of the Catechism, that I be, I'm not my own but belong body and soul to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for my sins with his precious blood, yeah. and he has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. And he loves me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. And because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life yeah. and makes me altogether willing and, that's, and ready from now on to live for and him. And that's a freedom. And that's and, a freedom. And that's really the message of the Bible when someone really studies the Bible. That is the that total freedom. message. It's not, hey, accept Christ and do whatever you want. It's accept Christ and become like Christ. And here's how it works by inner transformation. It's been an amazing journey. Michael, just <laughs> so much. And I appreciate you sharing your story. Well, thank you for uh, allowing me to. I know there's so much too. we didn't even cover, but uh, what a glorious message and ho hope for the LDS people. We love them. They love are them. good. They're trying so hard, but it doesn't matter how far you jump over the cliff. <laughs> you're, you're still falling short. Without, That's right. Amen, Jesus. Earl. So Amen. Thanks for joining us.